Good afternoon, John. Hi, how are you? I'm well, and how are you? I'm doing good. Good, good, good. We've got a couple of minutes, so I'm going to wait to see how many other people come in, and then we will get started. Sounds good. I'm gonna give them like three more minutes to 12.05 and then we can go ahead and start it. All right, not a problem.
Okay, John, we'll go ahead and get started. Maybe it's just going to be me and you. I'm not sure. Um, but if others come in, they can probably just follow along um, from where we're at. So let me start by asking, or let me start by introducing myself. So I'm Jonice Arthur, and I am the tutoring support specialist at LaSalle. Um, so I'm in charge of all the tutoring services, whether it be subject tutoring or um, SI instruction. And I also provide different workshops throughout the semester for students um, to basically assist them and be a resource um, and providing information for them to continue their journey and um, it be a successful journey. I'm also a LaSalle undergraduate alumni. So I'm very familiar with the curriculum and the different things that have happened, although it was some years ago, um, some things have not changed. So um, with that said, tell me a little bit about yourself and where you are in your journey at LaSalle. Um, I am a, well, technically a freshman here at LaSalle. I'm a political science major. Um, I was supposed to go last year, but I ended up taking a gap year. and. Um, okay. I really enjoyed it. It was probably the best thing I could have done. And, um, you know, now I'm just looking forward to getting back to campus and, uh, you know, I guess just learning. Okay. So have you um, done a semester? Like what, what have you done at LaSalle? A year yet or a semester? Where are you at in that part of the journey? Yeah, I've just done one semester. Okay. So good. Um, so this is the balancing act. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you. So if you like have a question or anything at the bottom of yours, there should be um, like one that says participants and underneath of there, you can raise your hand or do different things um, that'll let me know that you might, you know, need my attention um, and I'll be able to see it while I'm in the midst of the presentation. So let me share my screen with you. So social health, the balancing act, getting organized from day one. Um, one of the things that I actually like to start out with, actually, let me stop sharing that. I like to start out with something called the pretest. Can you see this? Yeah, I can. Okay. So the pretest just basically asks you to look at your previous um, semester and kind of look at the active activities that you were immersed in. Um, you know, did you participate in clubs? Um, are you an athlete? Did you have a job? You know, did you speak with your course instructors about your grades and progress during the semester? Were you surprised at your grades um, in the courses that you didn't do well in or the grades, you know, that you did somewhat well in? Um, are you a declared major? If so, are you staying in your major? Or if you're undeclared, is there a major that interests you after being there for um, a semester? Do you feel a sense of belonging to LaSalle? Um, did you use any you know, support services last semester, whether it had been your advisor, um, a student uh, success coach, um, tutoring, any of those things? Are you the first in your family to attend college? So these are all relevant questions. And then the second part of it just kind of asked you to describe your last semester at LaSalle, um, your classes, extracurricular activities or commitments outside of school, what went, what went well last semester, if you had the opportunity to rewind and redo your last semester here, what would you do differently? So one of the questions that I like to ask is, um, what went well with last semester? Um, I think that I really, I think that I really took the initiative to do the readings and to actually make sure that I was like making sure that I got everything out of the readings. Okay. And if there's an opportunity that you had to rewind, what's one thing that you might have done differently last semester that you didn't do? Um, I think that I might have spent more time talking to professors, communicating like what expectations were. Okay. So I will tell you, um, in addition to being an administrator at LaSalle, I'm also a professor and I teach, you know, different courses like psychology, um, social, um, college seminar, like I teach a lot of different courses, um, reading comprehension. And what I would say as a professor is that it 
would be very beneficial to students to reach out to their professors and have um, a better relationship with them because then again, expectations and all of those things would be clearer to the student um, as well as being able to just have that connection. So if there are any problems or any questions or concerns, you already have that interaction and that engagement piece with your professor to be able to reach out and get an answer. And especially with COVID and how things have been going and things having to be online, being connected with your professor is pretty much essential. And then the last part of this particular form goes into any factors that may have contributed to your academic performance, whether it was academic study skills, adjustments, any personal issues, um, time management, career and majors. Those are things that are very essential and important to thinking about when you're going into the next semester. What did I do this previous semester that worked? What did I do that didn't work? And what contributed to um, the success or deficit? And then the last part is test taking. When it comes to exams, multiple choice, research papers, writing assignments, oral presentations, or group projects, what is your comfort level with them? And the reason why these are essential because at LaSalle, you will do all of them. So that's just something to think about. Are you comfortable with them? Are you not comfortable? Do I not know yet because I haven't been exposed to it yet? So those are just things to take into um, consideration. So I'm gonna go back to the actual presentation itself and then we're gonna start um, from there. So, one of the first things that um, I talk to students about when your semester starts or prior to the semester, because most students move on campus if they're gonna be on campus before the actual semester. So walk the campus, make sure you're familiar with all the buildings um, you know, and all of your resources specifically, what is your class schedule? So you know with most of, the, most of the classes, there's like a 15 minute interval between when one class ends and the next one starts. So if you're all the way over at Founders Hall and then your next class is at Heyman, you know what I mean? That's a pretty long distance. So it's like you have to really be, you know, on your way um, when you're walking. So I always say, take a campus tour where you have your schedule with you and you're actually walking to your class locations so that you're seeing what the distance is between them and how long it's gonna take you to get there. Um, and mind you, you're doing it now when there's not inclement weather. If there's snow or if there's something else going on, you know, how will you make sure you're able to get to the next class and you're able to get there time, you know, on time? Um, one of the other places I look at is student accounts receivable. Sometimes um, when you're looking at you know, your refunds or different things like that, a lot of people go to financial aid. That's not the place that you would go to. You would go to, to student accounts receivable. Another name people have heard is called the bursar's office, but you would go there to find out about refunds, um, about different, you know, money that you might owe and things of that nature. So you wanna become familiar with them because a lot of times when you start the semester, there are different holds that you may have on your account and one office can't take the hold off from another office. So getting you know, familiar with the different offices that you'll probably come in contact with is very essential. Um, financial aid, again, um, are you receiving financial aid? Do you get FAFSA and, and all of that stuff? Yeah, I do. Okay, so one of the things that you should also be aware of is that financial aid did not begin January 1st, as far as your application for the next year. It actually started October the 1st. So you can apply as early as October the 1st prior to that January 1st of the next um, processing period to apply. And that was opened up because now they're accepting your parents' tax returns from two years prior. So since that should already be done, you can now apply earlier for financial aid. So I would say put it in as soon as possible versus waiting and then kind of being left it, you know, with whatever is available. Um, do you know where the financial aid office and students accounts receivable is? Yeah, I do. I think I remember um, going on tour and seeing all the offices as well. 
Okay. It is in the Lawrence building. So that is one of the administration buildings um, on campus. That's pretty much if you're at the um, student eating hall or, you know, the lunch hall, if you walk straight across from there going forward, like if you're standing at the front door and you walk straight across, that's um, the Lawrence building. So that's where you would find it. That's also where my office is located in the tutoring center and the Center for Academic Achievement. So all of that is in there. Next, advising. Um, advising is important as well. Are you a declared major or undeclared at this point? I'm declared for political I, science. Okay. That was my major when I first went to college and then I changed it. Um, but so when you're um, looking at advising, your advisor is the person that can basically sit down with you and say, hey, this is what your plan looks like over the next four years. Um, and this is how you may want to plan out your classes each semester. Your advisor is the one that can tell you whether or not, you know, your classes can be taken concurrently, or maybe one class has to be taken before the next class. Um, they will also be helpful because some of the classes or courses you'll need to take are only offered in the fall or are only offered in the spring. So you wanna make sure that if it's only offered in a fall class, that you're able to take it in the fall um, and that you don't wait. And then you're like, oh, okay, I'll take it in the spring. And then it's like, oh, it's not offered in the spring. And that class may be a requisite or prerequisite to another class that you need to take. So your advisor is the key person in helping you kind of map out your four years at LaSalle and what that four years will look like, whether or not you'll need to take five classes a semester, six classes a semester, if you'll need to take summer courses, all that stuff um, can be mapped out by your, let's see, advisor. Student wellness, um, that would be the counseling center as well as the wellness center where you can go and talk about like different things concerning yourself, um, whether it's, you know, just feeling overwhelmed about different things, whether, you know, there are issues that are happening outside of school, you know, that could be personal where you need someone to talk to. The wellness center is the place to go to sit down with a counselor or someone that you can basically debrief and talk about what it is that you're feeling and get some feedback on different things that you can do to help you out. And then last, the career center. Um, that is located also over in Founders Hall. There's a huge center there. They're really good with helping with resume writing, um, cover letter writing, um, also finding out about different internships. They often have job fairs and different things of that nature that are very helpful to students. Um, before I move on, are there any questions? Yeah, where's the wellness center? So the wellness center, okay. Do you know where Founders Hall is? Yeah, I think I'm familiar with that. It's like at the corner of Worcester and is that Chu? It's a huge building, it's brand new. Yeah, and you yeah. you go right next to that and you make a left, there's like this long driveway that like goes down to the old hospital. It used to be Germantown Hospital. Yeah, the that's where we, uh, we row there. So the wellness center is located inside that building. Okay, cool. Like, That's actually really helpful. Not kind of inside, but it's like right next to, but you'll see it like as you're driving down that long road, you'll see the sign for the wellness center and then you'll be able to go into it. But yeah, if you do rowing there, it's like right across from there. So it's pretty good, uh, pretty good location, but definitely utilize it. Like a lot of students don't utilize it and they feel like, oh, I can handle this on my own. But when that stress starts piling up between, you know, you're rowing, you've got academics, you've got, you know, other things that you're dealing with and family, all that stuff can kind of pile on you. And you want to make sure you have someone that you can talk to to kind of see you through that. So the wellness center is the place to go. All right. So one of the things that I talk about is scheduling out your semester. What does that look like? So you see a number 168. What does that stand for? Um, I have no clue. Okay, most people don't. It's the amount of hours that you have in a week. 
there are 168 hours in a week. So when you're looking at your schedule, let's say you have five classes, the rule of thumb is to give two to three hours of study time to every one hour of class you have. So let's say you're taking a course. Most courses are what? Two hours and 30 minutes a week if you're taking it twice a week. So if you multiply that times two, you're looking at at least five hours of studying for just one class. So if you have five classes, five hours, that's 25 hours that you're basically putting into it a week for those five classes. Now that's assuming that some of your classes are easy. If they're more difficult classes, then you might have to give more time to that. So understanding that, then you also know now that being a student is a full-time job because in addition to the classes that you're taking, if you're taking five courses, they're two and a half hours a week, and then you're adding another 25 hours onto that a week for study time, that's a full-time job. So that's something you have to take in consideration. Um, most people say 25 hours is a lot of time to put into a week just for the study portion of it. But let me ask a question. Do you ever binge watch shows? I don't care if it's Law and Order, you know, CSI, do you ever find yourself where you sit down and it's just a Saturday or it's a football game on or they're rowing in Philadelphia and you're just watching television for several hours? I do it all the time. Okay. So as a professor, I know that I have stuff that I have to do. I have papers I have to mark. I have grading that I have to do. But every now and again on a Saturday, I'll see Law and Order and I'll sit down and I'll tell myself, I'm only going to watch one or two episodes. Have you ever watched Law and Order before? Yeah, I love Law and Order. Okay. So you know at the beginning of the next episode when it goes, doom, doom, that loud noise. So yeah. I'm getting up and I'm like, all right, I'm done. But as soon as I hear that loud noise, I sit back down like, wait, I am not about to miss another episode, especially if it's Law and Order SVU. That one is my favorite. So I sit down and before I know it, it's gone from, you know, dawn to dusk. And I've been sitting here binge watching Law and Order all day. So you have to get to the point where you're able to actually give that same binge watch time to your studies as well. But if you're looking at 25 hours in a week period, that's over seven days. So one of the things that I go over, I'm going to unshare this, but I have some other things that I want to share with you. And if it's something that'll be instrumental to you, I will send these to you. So the first thing I wanna share is a semester plan. So this one allows you to basically input your whole semester, all 15 weeks for each one of your courses. So you would basically type in your courses up here, up to seven. Um, I believe to take seven courses, you really have to be approved for that. But for most kids, you know, most people, you're able to take up to 18 credits, 21 is stretching it um, a semester. But you would put your courses here and then the week range, whatever that week is, and underneath of each course, you would literally write assignments or different things that you have due for those courses. Um, and that would be, like I said, from semester one, all from um, the first week all the way to week 15. And you're able to fill this out. For the most part, your professor syllabus, I know mine do, already have assignments and test dates pre-scheduled. So it's not like it's something that's gonna be a pop-up on you or it's gonna be a surprise. All of the work that you have is already on the syllabus, which would make it easy for you to be able to fill out this particular form. Also helpful may be to use the week at a glance. So the week at a glance, let's see if I actually put this in here, allows you to look at each day of the week and then put in what you need to put in as far as assignments or where you need to be, your family time, work time. So this is a whole week that you're looking at from early morning you know, until the wee hours of the night, what are you doing? Do you need to be reading a specific, you know, um, textbook? Do you need to be working on a specific assignment? This allows you to actually get that done. 
So that's something that also may be um, useful for you. I actually wanted to pull up one more. It is the week at a glance. Let me see. Okay, it's this one. So sometimes people say having a whole semester might be too much. So maybe I'll list it out for a month. And here are all my courses lined up. And then for each one of those weeks, I'm gonna put in what's due for that week. The other part that may be really helpful is to put in the percentage of your grade that that particular assignment may be for, because maybe if it's a quiz, it's worth 5%. You're like, okay, that's not a lot. Um, you really don't wanna miss any of your assignments, but if for any reason you're behind or something is happening, you really wanna look at that percentage and how much that assignment is gonna to be towards your overall grade. So that's something to think about as well. Um, any questions thus far? No, I think that's all really cool. I really like the uh, the last one you just showed me because it seemed like it'd be really helpful. Oh, for the month? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes having it for a whole semester can be a bit cumbersome. So I found for me, if I kind of put it for the month, and I print it out and I put it up like when, you know, I was in school, I would put it on my um, cork board in my room and kind of look at, okay, so what do I have due this week? All right, and what percentage of it is my grade? So this one I really, really need to work on because this is, you know, 30% of my grade. So I really need to put a lot of effort into it. This one is only worth 5% of my grade. I need to complete the assignment, but not as much may need to be put into this particular one as the one that's worth 30%. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I think it also helps with like choosing which assignment to do first, just because you know like right. which so one's Right, so we are about party. to talk about that as well. Um, so looking at which assignment actually comes into what we'll be talking about in a few minutes prioritizing your work. So a lot of times we look at, oh, okay, well, this assignment is not due to the 28th of February. This assignment is due to 21st. So I'm gonna work on the one that's due to 21st. But then when you actually look at the assignment, the one that's due on the 28th has several steps that are involved where the one that's due on the 21st is kind of a quick assignment. You know, it doesn't take a lot of effort. So prioritizing your work is going to play a very big deal in being successful at doing it. So maybe the one on the 28th is gonna require me to break it down into four different steps where I say, okay, step one, I need to be done this week, step two, this week, step three, that week, step four, this week, and then I need to look over it overall to make any changes so that it can be submitted by the 28th where the assignment on the 21st could be a quick writing assignment where they're asking you, you know, to write you know, a summary of your goals, or maybe it was an article that you read and you're being able to write, you're being asked to write a reflection on that article, either pro or con. So prior to prioritizing your work does play a very big deal in your success in school, not just going off of the date that the assignment is due, but looking at the assignment in its totality and deciding how you wanna break that assignment up, especially, in a situation where you have group assignments. Break larger tasks into smaller components. Um, one of the things that I've seen students do is kind of look at it and say, oh, okay, I need to do this. And then they wait till the last minute to start working on the assignment. And it's like, oh my God, um, yeah, I didn't know I was gonna have to do all this. So now they're scrambling to try to get everything done. So again, breaking your larger tasks into smaller components and then giving yourself a deadline for them. So let's say for instance, an assignment is done on February 28th. I might give myself a deadline of having it done by the 21st. So that way I can go over it, maybe sit with my student success coach or sit with even the professor to get some overall feedback on, okay, this is what I've come up with, you know, or with some of your classmates, is there anything that you see that I might be able to change or you know, improve on? So giving yourself an earlier deadline to the actual deadline that something is due is also helpful. Less time for easier classes, more time for harder classes. Again, prioritizing your work 
if you know that math is easy for you and it's not really going to take much when it comes to math, then that might be a class that maybe you only give, say, two hours a week to studying versus, say, a philosophy or psychology class that's a little bit more, you know, cumbersome and you're looking into, if you're political science, at some point you're going to be looking into law and different policies. That's going to take a lot longer because that is your specialized vocabulary, meaning this is um, these are words and vocabulary that you're really going to need to know because they're in your field of work. So spending more time with them is going to be very important, especially if you have a professor that's not more into asking you definitions, but is more into having you apply those definitions to real world applications. So that's something to look at as well. Any questions so far? No, it's all good. All right. LaSalle is notorious for this one, group projects. <laughs> I never like group projects. I never like being put in a group to work with anybody else because I've never liked anyone else's work hampering or hindering or affecting my grade. However, LaSalle was very big on group projects because they're preparing you for the real world. When I work, there are times when I'm autonomous with different projects that I have, but then there are other times where I have to work with a group of people and the success of the project really depends on our ability to work as a team. So you're going to find as a freshman, you know, going forward, you are going to have group projects. And the, the, the intention is not for you to take on everybody else's work. Like I used to and say, look, I'm just gonna do everybody's stuff, get it done or, Hand me in what you have. Let me make the improvement so I can hand it in and we'll all get an A. That's not it. The intention is so that everyone takes on their own responsibility and does their part as a group and works, you know, functional as a team so that the end result and the success level is not from one or two people, but it's for from everyone as a whole. Have you done any group projects as of yet? Um, we just had kind of like breakout rooms. I haven't had anything too evolved yet. Okay, well, this is your first semester as a freshman and you're going into your second one. I guarantee as you get closer to your junior year, you're definitely going to be involved in group projects. Um, work complementary to school. Are you looking at or have you looked at taking on a part-time job? Is that something that you um, are looking into doing or may have to do? Yeah, that's something I have to do. Okay, so you want to look at work as complementary to school, not school complementary to work. So you want to try to get a position or establish a position, whether on campus or off, that works in cahoots with your school schedule. Not that you're working so much and then you're scrambling to get your school work done. Because again, school should be your full-time job whereas the job is kind of like the part-time, but I understand um, needing to have the income in, whether it's for tuition or different things that you need. So having that balancing act is really important. So if you find that with work, you're you know, top heavy, meaning you've got more work at the beginning of the week to do, versus the end, then you might wanna push your study hours and your you know, hours when it comes to your schoolwork towards the middle and end part of the week and vice versa. But just kind of making sure that your work schedule um, is complementary and, and fits well and gels well with your school schedule is, is pretty important. And what about family time? Um, I actually live with three other family members, so it's kind of something that I is have so to do. cool. Okay, that's really cool. Um, I know for a lot of kids, that's not the norm. They're not going to live with their family members, so they have to kind of make that time for family. Um, I'm going to share with you something that my um, children did in a little bit. Coordinating time with friends also falls into that. Whether that coordination of time is, okay, we all have the same classes because we're in our freshman and our sophomore, you know, years. So we're doing our preliminary classes right now, whether it be English, you know, math. So because we have some of the same classes, how about we hang out? We can do some study groups, you know, but all, you know, all, what is it? All work and no play. 
leads to a boring life. So you also have to kind of carve out that time where you're able to spend time with your friends and spend time with your family, but also making sure that that time is not infringing on time that you need to study. And you probably have no idea what that is. Like zero idea. Yeah. So this is a person laying down on their stomach and then the two roll up arms is someone else massaging their back. <laughs> so I see it. supposed to be, can you see it now that I told you? Yeah, I can. Okay. So this is now relaxation. So I've got school, I've got work, I've got family, I've got friends, but what about me time? There also has to be a component that you give to yourself whether it's just sitting in my room with the lights out, looking at the ceiling, relaxing, sitting, music on. I'm not talking to anybody else. I'm not on social media. I'm just spending some time with myself. I know a lot of men don't do this, but going to the salon and just having a pedicure. I didn't say you had to get pink nail polish, but if you want that, get that too. But just going, spending some time for self, you know, decompressing, sitting down, meditating, yoga, all those things contribute to me time, self time, not having to do anything for anyone else but yourself. And that is important. Inventory. So this is where I take the time to ask myself a few questions. How am I doing? I'm not talking about school. I'm not talking about grades. I'm talking about emotionally, physically, mentally. How am I? Where am I at right now? That's taking inventory. That's that internal inventory that helps people from getting burnout, meltdown, pass out, or breakdown, okay? You have to take that time, whether it's once a week, whether it's at the end of each day, you know, today was a really long day with a lot going on. Let me take inventory. How do I feel today? What's going on with me today? And then putting in the necessary. So inventory and me time really work in cahoots with one another. Because once you take that inventory, then you need to plan out what type of me time do I need? Do you currently do that? Um, I'd say I do it maybe weekly. Okay. I don't do it regularly as much as I should, maybe. Okay, but you should. Because if you don't recognize what's going on with you, it'll creep up. And then at that point, kind of like the air, as long as the air is clear, we're fine. But at the point you start seeing smog, at that point, it's probably too late for you to really, really do anything about it. So taking inventory on a regular is important. And then know when to say no. Sometimes we stretch ourselves really, really thin and we're like that yes person. We don't want to tell our family no. We don't want to tell our friends no. We don't want to tell this one no. But sometimes knowing when to say no is what it needs to be. I will give, I will do, but at times where it's stressing me out or pulling me apart, I have to say no. And that could even be hanging out with your friends. Like, hey man, we going out today. We going to Teak or we're going here. That might not be the day that you can do it. You know, if you've got work and you've got school and you've done this, it doesn't matter what they say. After taking inventory of yourself, you know that the answer may have to be no for that particular day. Now we're gonna get into setting goals. And again, I'm gonna go back to that whole communication with family a little bit later. Progression, not perfection. And this is something that I have had to talk to my students about for a really long time. I remember having a student um, some time ago and his father created like one of the big like online resources that people use and he had, you know, two siblings. One of them was athletic. The other one was, you know, music, Juilliard, that type of thing. But he was like the brainiac, like the dad. And I remember him getting a 97 on one of my tests. And he came to me and said, you know, what can I do to get a hundred? You know, 
can I do extra credit? Can I do? And I'm like, are, are you serious? You know, if you ever hit perfection, you've hit the ceiling. There's nowhere else for you to go. There's nowhere else for you to, you know, kind of pull for, kind of look for, kind of look in, you know, the future and project for. There are no other goals that you can have. So it's never about perfection. Even if you find that, you know, on a test, you got a 75 or a 76 and you're like, yeah, this is not the norm. Like I am an A student. I have always been an A student. Okay, I get that. But maybe this is a harder class and maybe you need to reflect and now kind of reboot what needs to be done for this class so that the next test you get, you get an 80 something. You progress and then work your way back up. Perfection is an unrealistic goal. And trust me, I was one of those, I had to have everything right. Everything had to be in order. I had to have a 4.0 average. And if I didn't have a 4.0 average, it was, you know, it was gonna be the death of me. By the time I got to my first master's program, I wasn't concerned about magna cum laude, summa cum laude. I was thank you laude as long as I got my degree, okay? So, you know, you have to begin to look at that as well. A 3.44, it's nothing wrong with a 3.44. No, it's not a 4.0, but it's still a B, you know? And if you feel that you have the ability to do better, then by all means, push, you know what I mean? To get towards whatever that goal is that you want. Any questions so far? No, no, it's all really good. Okay. And then you want to use something called the SMART goal technique. Have you ever heard of it before? I have not. Okay. So the SMART goal technique is important because it stands for a specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time framed. One of the reasons why most people don't reach a goal is because it's not a specific goal. I'll give you an example. I remember some months back going to my doctors, standing on the scale, and they gave me this number. <laughs> I'm not telling you what the number is. And my doctor said, oh, well, you know, Jonice, um, you know, based on your BMI, you're obese. Obese? You know what I mean? I'm going to say your mom's obese. You know what I mean? But you, know, you don't talk about nobody's mom like that or whatever. But what do you mean obese? Like, I'm not fat. Like, I don't, you know, I don't have cankles and I don't, but it's not based on, you know, having a whole bunch of roles and whatnot. It's based on your BMI. And he said, you know, I would like to see you down for your height, no more than 175. So he tells me that. And I'm like, wait, that is a large number. So now it's time for me to set a goal. A non-specific and broad goal would me say would me, would be me saying, "I want to lose weight." Okay, well, I got on the treadmill and I ran and I lost five pounds. There you go, I lost weight. A more specific goal would be, "I want to lose forty pounds." That's specific and to the point. So now the next part of um, smart is measurable. How will I measure being able to reach that goal? Well, maybe I set smaller goals and benchmarks for myself that every time I reach five pounds down, I celebrate. So I'm at 40, I'm exercising or whatever. Before the month is over, you know, I go and I stand on the scale and I've lost five pounds. That's measurable. I can literally measure that I'm losing that weight. The next is attainable. Am I willing and able to put in the work necessary to reach that goal? That's only a question that you can ask. Are you willing to put in the work is one thing. Are you able to put in the work is the second part of that. If you are willing and both able to put in the work, to get the resources that are necessary, then by all means, that goal is attainable. Now, here's the tricky one. Is it realistic? Is this something that I can actually do? I know I'm willing to, and I know I'm able to, but is it something that I can actually get to? I may be willing and physically able 
to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. But is it realistic that I will? Absolutely not. You have to think about those things. <clears throat> is it something that's realistic for me, <laughs> excuse me, to do in this time period or in this lifetime or while I'm looking at it? And then the last part is time frame. One of the reasons why people don't reach their goals is because they don't give themselves enough time to reach it. One of the things that I was told when starting my business um, was that most businesses lose money in the first five years. So you have to be willing to at least put that five-year period in and perhaps lose money during that five-year period prior to being able to make money. So when it came to, let's say that 40 pounds, then my, my first question to my doctor would be, well, how much weight can you lose in a month and it be healthy weight loss that you can actually keep off? Because I'm not trying to binge lose. I'm trying to lose it in a way so that I'm able to maintain it once it's gone. And the doctor says, well, anywhere from two to five pounds a month loss is realistic. So if I know my exercise routine and I know where I'm at and I might be lazy or a beginning starter or five pounds may not be realistic for me to lose a month. So I might be around that three pound a month. Let's just say I'm around that three pound a month. So then now that informs me of my time frame because if I'm trying to lose 40 pounds and I'm losing three pounds a month, I'm looking at at least what? 13 months. So I'm looking at losing 40 pounds over a little bit more than a year. So now my goal is smart. It's specific. I can measure it. I'm willing and able to do it. It's something that's realistic. And now I have my time frame in which I'm able to do it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It reminds me of this quote I heard that's if you fail to plan, you plan to plan fail. To fail. Exactly. Exactly. And one part of being able to reach that SMART goal is this picture. Can you tell what that is? Yeah, it's like somebody getting their eyes examined. Right. And when the picture becomes blurry, what does that eye doctor do to help it not be blurry? He switches the thing so it's clear. Right. And that's called what? Begins with an F. Focusing. There you go. So in order for you to reach that SMART goal, you have to begin to focus. Actually begin to focus your lens on that goal. See yourself reaching that goal. See yourself in that place. I can recall my brother, one of my brothers, he used to tell me, you know, whenever I wanted something, I would take a picture of what I wanted and put it in all my main places. One in my car, one in the bathroom, and one at work. And every day I would see that picture, it would keep me what? Focused on that goal. So every car he wanted, every house he wanted, he always had a picture of what that looked like. And within that time period of, you know, creating that SMART goal, he had it because everything he needed to focus, he kept in his main areas. And then once you reach the, reach the goal, then you, you celebrate. You celebrate yourself. Even if you're celebrating the small goals that you reach, you know, as you're going. Let's say with the 40 pounds, every time I've lost five, I celebrate. I do something to say, hey girl, you did it. You get what I mean? So you have to celebrate yourself even prior to reaching the goal. Every small goal you reach, every small step you take towards that larger goal is a celebration for you. Your goal is getting that degree in political science from LaSalle. Every small goal, every semester that you've completed successfully is a small goal reached towards what? Your larger goal of getting that bachelor's degree. So celebrate yourself every time there's a semester over and you've done well. And then involving your family and your friends. So we talked about earlier being able to spend that time with family. So this picture that you see, um, my children are 10 years apart. And so at one point um, when my older son left to go to college, he wasn't able to spend that time with my younger son 
and my younger son was really having some issues with that. So they scheduled the time and my older son actually took the initiative for this one. They scheduled times where they could be on the phone and be doing homework together. It was so cool and they could like see each other and stuff and you know, um, Dorian is my older son and Daniel's my younger and he would be doing his homework and then Daniel would be doing his. But at the same time, when Daniel had questions about something he was doing, he could ask his older brother and his brother would walk him through it. So although he couldn't be there physically, this was their time together, but it was also, you know, lucrative time being spent because they were also doing homework assignments and study assignments. Like if, you know, Dorian had reading that he had to do, to make reading better for our younger one who really didn't like to read, he would say, okay, well, this is my reading time. Call me at this time and we can read together. I'll be reading my stuff and you can read yours as well. So that was the time that they spent, which I thought was ingenious because I'd never kind of seen that before. Um, and then a lot of times, I'm not sure if this is something you experience, but a lot of times um, students get a lot of pressure from family to perform and to do well. And that pressure is not always easy. So instead of having your family on the outside looking in, having them a part of instead of apart from, include them, let them know what it is that you're doing. Hey, this is what my study time looks like. This is what I'm reading. This is what I'm going over. You know, these are areas that I'm still struggling with. This is an area that I'm still, you know, having problems with as far as really being able to focus and put the time in that's needed for my reading or put the time in that's needed for my studying. This is where you incorporate your family into that journey. Maybe mom is the one that says, hey, you know, haven't heard from you. How are you doing on your studies? Or, hey, you know, I know you have a test coming up. Send me over the information so I can quiz you over the phone. Or this is where you incorporate, you know, family members, cousins, brothers and sisters, those people that you're close with to really help you in the areas that you need that help in, not just your friends. Are there any questions thus far? No, it's really good. And then the last part, know when to admit that you need help and then get the help that you need. If you're struggling in any area and it doesn't even have to be academic, what I have found um, in my field of psychology and doing research, a lot of students um, that flunk out or drop out of college, it's non-academic. It's not even the academics for why. It's the non-academic barriers that they're dealing with outside of school that then hinge and begin to affect their performance in school. And it becomes overwhelming and too much. And as a result, they give up and they drop out. So with that said, know when you need help and reach out to those people that will be able to provide the help with you, whether it's the Student Wellness Center, whether it's your student success coach, whether it's your advisor, whomever it is, even if it's a professor, um, leaning on them is a really good resource. And I found that so because a lot of the professors that I had had already been in the fields that I was looking to go into. So I was able to get a lot of feedback from them concerning what it was gonna take for me to be able to become what I wanted to become, which at the time was a teacher. So what am I gonna have to do? You know. How many years is it gonna take? What type of certifications do I have to get? Like all that information they were able to provide for me. And it was really useful for me to kind of know ahead of time what I was walking into and what I would need to do. And that's actually why I changed my, um, my major from political science, because initially I knew I wanted to work with children. I knew I wanted to be you know, an advocate for them, a help to them. But when I started looking at all the law books and different things that I would have to know and the different readings that I would have to read just for one case, let alone if I had more than one, I'm not a reader. So I was like, yeah, no, mm -mm. yeah, that's not for me. But um, so those are the things that you really want to look at. Where do I need help? And knowing the resources that you have to reach out to to get that help. And even if you don't know necessarily where to go, inquire. Your advisor. Um, your student success coach, if you have one, I believe if you're an athlete, you will have a student success coach. Um, your professors, 
reach out to those people that are in the know to find out what you need to know and what help you might require. Awesome. And that was it for today. That was the, um, the workshop. So are there any questions that you have um, from the workshop or anything um, really not connected to the workshop, but in your planning and balancing you know, stages for this coming semester, you just had a question or needed some insight to that I'd be able to help you with? Um, no, it's just really learning how to juggle, you know, the whole thing that's college, just because okay. uh, we're online, you know, being online, you're at home, a lot of distractions, a lot of things to take you off track. Absolutely. Um, one of the things, and this is actually another workshop that I'll probably be doing a little bit later in the semester, but one of the things that I tell people is to find a place and a time where there aren't any distractions. Like I say all the time, I could be available to my kids all day long, but that one hour I decide to steal away to my office or to my room, here they come knocking the door down. Really, I've been available for 23 hours a day and the one hour I need to work, now you wanna come and I'll ask, you guys need anything? You wanna spend any time? You wanna do, no mom, we're good. And then as soon as I steal away, here you guys come. And then if I say I'm working, then I have to, okay, never mind. Now I get the guilt trip, even though I've been available all day. So, you know, being realistic with yourself about a time that works for you and a time that you know maybe other family members aren't around or you'll have that alone time, that also is really good to know. So that when you're making that schedule that we went over, um, where I showed you throughout the week from eight to 11 at night, when you're making that schedule, you can be realistic about when you actually have time to read or study or do your assignments when family members are not there or when, you know, the house is not as lively, you know, where they expect you to be involved. So that's something to think about as well. Yeah, that's really good advice. Thank you. You're welcome. If there's anything that I can help you with, you can always reach out to me at M-O-N-D, Mary Oscar, Nancy David, J, the number one at LaSalle.edu. Um, if there's anything from the workshop, just shoot me an email and I will send it to you so that you'll have the template and you can use it. All right, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for coming on. I hope that you were able to utilize and will be able to utilize what you've learned from today. And like I said, if you have any questions or you need any resources, reach out to me. And if I don't know, I'll find someone who does. All right, thank you so much. You're have a welcome. good rest of your day. You too.